years ago, back when our youngest child was about four or five years old, he got lost in Canton, Ohio. He was playing out in the yard, and uh, the ball got away from him, and he took off to get the ball, and the ball kept rolling, and he kept running after it until finally he had no idea where he was, and we didn't have any idea where he was. And just thankfully, he knocked on the only door in that whole area where someone who was involved in child safety services answered the door. And they called the police, and the police got him back to us. And, uh, and that was one of the most frightful days I ever put in. There's just not very many good ways you can use the word lost. There may be few. We like to lose weight now and then. We like to uh, maybe lose our temper a little more than sometimes we're able to. I guess my real problem is finding my temper. It's, it's not losing it. I can lose it easy. I just can't find it. That's the problem. But at any rate, uh, there's a few ways you might use the word loss that's a pos in the positive sense. But for the most part, it's one of the uglier words in the English language lost. It's just hard to contemplate how you can make that word look any better than it looks. It's an awful word. It describes the deepest fears within most of us, especially if it's a child who's lost or something along that line. Jesus said he came to this earth to save that which was lost. He had committed himself, leaving heaven, to come to this earth, be a good example for us, teach us and prepare us for the kingdom of heaven and eternal life, and leave people behind saved that once were lost. God bless him for doing that. I will forever be saddened by the fact that it was me that made him do it. But I'll be happy that he was willing to. Jesus told a lot of parables. The word parable itself comes from a word which means to lay alongside of. When I was a boy, we were taught in Bible class that a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. I can still remember our teachers drilling us with that. Some of the parables of Jesus are very well known. The parable of the Good Samaritan, for instance, is, is known worldwide and uh, is held as a great example, if of nothing else, literature itself. But it is the parables that we find in Luke, the 15th chapter, that we want to focus on for a little while this evening. Jesus didn't always tell us why he told the parables he told. Sometimes he just simply tells the parables. Now occasionally he'll tell you exactly why he's chosen to tell this particular parable or that particular parable. He'll even go on sometimes at the end of a parable to explain it so that people can see it more clearly and other times he just simply offered no explanation for it. He just gave the parable and went on. But Luke 15 contains three parables about being lost. And each of them is significant because each of them may affect you or someone you care for very deeply. In this particular case, we know why Jesus gave the three parables he gave in Luke 15. He was being picked on for spending too much time with sinners. He was being looked down upon because he took time to associate with publicans. Now, you and I admire and respect a preacher who will get out there and mingle with the lost and try to bring them to the Lord. But, but the Lord suffered a lot of ridicule for that. 
probably due more to the leaders of the Jews' own selfishness and their self-concerns than anything else, but they were continually putting Jesus down for spending time with the wrong kind of people, associating with people from the wrong kind right side of the tracks. And so prompted by the complaints of religious leaders about Jesus' contact with sinners, he tells us that there were three different reasons why sinners get lost. The first one is in uh, verses 3 through 7, and it's the parable of the lost sheep. You remember the parable. Uh, a herdsman has 100 sheep. One of them is lost. He, he gets the, I would assume, the, the 99 kind of as protected as he can, and then he's off to find that little lost sheep. Eventually he finds it, he brings it back, and there's joy in the house. And we look at that and we say, why was that sheep lost? What caused that sheep to be lost? And you know the only answer I can give you? It's own carelessness. That sheep didn't wake up one morning and say, you know, I'm tired of running around with the other 99. I'm just going to take off. There aren't very many Christians that wake up one morning and say, you know, I'm just sick and tired of being a Christian. I'm going to leave the church. I'm going to leave God. I'm going to leave Jesus. And I'm just going to go out into the... Uh, the far country, and have a good old time. We don't have very many people who do that. We have some who might. But you know, for the most part, people are lost through carelessness, their own carelessness. In the process of wandering around, feeding here, feeding there, all of a sudden, the sheep was lost. It was neglect. It was neglect because he just wandered away. Did he mean to do it? No. Would he ever do it again? I guess he probably could, but I doubt that he would set out to try to. But he was lost because of his own carelessness. You know, God recognizes in Hebrews chapter uh, 2 that people can be lost that way. He talks about how can we be saved if we neglect so great salvation. As he talks about our coming to Jesus, our finding a home with him and a hope with him, he says... Don't, don't neglect this now. Some versions have it, don't drift away. Pay attention to where you are. Look for trends in your life. Exercise some self-control. You don't have to rebel against God to be lost. You don't have to shake an angry fist at God in times of loss and sorrow to be lost. All you have to do is drift away. I've watched it happen over and over and over again. In my years of preaching, I've baptized several hundred people. Of those several hundred people, I've probably, if I could check it, carefully, probably baptized at least 50 or 60 who just drifted away. You got some here in Sandyville that do that? They just drift away. They don't mean it. They don't mean to be mean. But they just get involved in other things. They just get their lives so full of, of responsibilities that all of a sudden, instead of going to church, they're going here. All of a sudden, they begin to think about retirement instead of serving God today. 
All of a sudden, they get their mind and their life focused on something else, and they look up, and God's so far away. God didn't move. They did. They were careless. God is represented by the shepherd. And God is a seeking God. He does not rest comfortably when one of us drifts away. He does not rest comfortably when we're careless with our souls and our commitment. He waits, but not long. When he realizes what has happened, he goes out on the hunt of that lamb because he loves that lamb. That lamb's valuable to him. And the lamb really did nothing terrible. More likely, he just did nothing. He lost through his own carelessness. The second parable is in Luke chapter 15, verses 8 through 10. This time, it's a coin. Not just any coin. Scholars think it may have been a coin that was part of this lady who lost its wedding dowry. The wedding dowry was very special to women of those times. As a rule, women were not involved in financial affairs, and sometimes the only thing they really had that they could say, this is mine, was money that her parents would give her when she married. And it would be like a link to the family she left behind in marrying. This lady one of her coins came up missing. Now that coin wasn't lost because it was careless. Coins can't think that way. <laughs> you know, they can't reason. But coins, coin, that coin didn't get lost because it was careless. You know how that coin got lost? Because she was careless. Because she lost it. It's bad enough that someone can be lost just through carelessness, just drift away without any kind of malice or meanness. Just wake up one day and not care anymore. But it's even worse when someone is lost because of someone else's carelessness. Want some examples of it? Saying the wrong thing in the wrong way. That's careless. It's careless in the sense that if you say it in the wrong place, in the wrong time, in the wrong setting, and the wrong person hears it, it may turn them away from God for the rest of their lives. I've seen it happen. I've seen people that I've talked with about obeying the gospel or coming back to the Lord sit or stand and grab the, the back of the pew in front of them and squeeze it until their hands are snow white to keep them from coming forward because they don't want to be gossiped about when brothers and sisters in Christ start thinking, I wonder what they did this time. You say the wrong thing at the wrong time. And your carelessness can drive a person away from the Lord. You don't have to be careless. Sometimes you're a victim of someone else's carelessness. And when you're lost through the carelessness of others, it's especially hurtful because the church is not supposed to be that way. The church is to be a respite from the way the world treats people. It's supposed to be a respite from the tension and the turmoil that fills so many homes and so many families Monday through Saturday. 
Church is supposed to be a place where we can come and we can pour out our hearts to God and we can find comfort and, and satisfaction. I watched your elders tonight as member after member filed by. I listened to the kind words they said. I watched the hugs they gave. I listened to their promises to pray. That's what church ought to be. But all too often it's no different than the world. Some churches just can't get along inside. Someone will answer for that. Don't allow the carelessness of others to cause you to be lost. Jesus warned us all about being guilty of causing a stumbling block or, or being a, a, an offense of sort to people around us. In other words, our living in such a way that it trips them up. People who know you're a Christian watch you closer than you think they do. They want to see if it's real. They want to know if you're real. Don't make them victims of your carelessness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 11 and following, and really through a lot of the latter part of 1 Corinthians, Paul warns the church at Corinth about all of the fussing and fighting and discord that seem to be going on there. In fact, in one part of that letter, he says, you're still carnal, you're still fleshly, you haven't got... You haven't been able to wrap your heart around this spiritual thing. And I know that you're that way because of the division among you. A congregation that no longer meets but was within driving distance of this area. Split. Marty and I were engaged and that's where we went to church when I would go down to Racine to see her. And... Uh, it was a nice little congregation. Usually had about 60 people there. And then they had a fuss. And some of them wouldn't let go of it. 20 left, went across the river to another town and started worshiping there. 20 stayed and tried to keep that congregation going. The other 20, as far as I know, they never darkened the door of a church building again. Not through their carelessness, but through the carelessness of others. The carelessness of folks like you and me. Paul warns us even when we go to reach those who have left, to do it with meekness, to do it with love, to do it carefully. In essence, he says, you better be careful about it because you may be the next one who needs correction and you know how you would like to be treated. Don't allow your carelessness, whether it be words spoken or examples lived or whatever, don't allow your carelessness to stumble and cause others to lose the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, we are asked to speak the truth in love. I assume that's publicly and privately. We sang when I was a little boy, watch your mouth, watch your mouth, what it says. Watch your mouth, watch your mouth, what it said. I wish that 40-year-olds could sing that song with the same zeal four-year-olds do. That coin was lost, just as lost as that sheep was, but for a totally different reason. A sheep was lost because it got careless. Had no one to blame but itself, but it, it, it just got lost because it was careless. That coin got lost because that lady was careless. And what she lost was something precious to her. 
But it was still lost because she let her guard down. But even to her, God was a seeking God. Verses 11 through 24 of the 15th chapter is really the only parable we tend to remember from Luke 15. It's the parable of the prodigal son. Next to the parable of the Good Samaritan, probably the best known parable Jesus ever spoke. We assume certain things about it, and those assumptions are are safe. They don't hurt it. And and a lot of times a parable is not meant to be exact in every single facet of it. Sometimes there's a core truth there it's trying to get to. And that seems to be the case with this boy. He comes to his dad, and he says to his dad, I wish you were dead so I could have what belongs to me. Now, he didn't say those words, but that's what the words he did say meant. He had no claim on the inheritance until his dad died. As long as his dad was alive, the inheritance was not his to spend. But like a lot of young people, he just kind of got tired of home. He got tired of this. He got tired of that. And he just wanted to blow that popsicle stand and, and go somewhere else and see what's happening. So he said, Dad, I wish you were dead. Isn't that awful? What could you want that could make you say something like that? But he did. Evidently, the father didn't respond immediately, but at some point he relented and he gave the boy his inheritance, his part of what his dad had to give. And he took off into what his older brother would later call a far country of sin, wasted his life, his his wealth and all in sinful living, and ended up slopping hogs. There was not a more shameful occupation in the world for a Jewish son than slopping hogs. That was as low as you can get on the ladder. And he's in there thinking one day, boy, that stuff's looking better every day. I'm about tempted to eat it. I'm starved. And all of a sudden, he came to himself, and he said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go home. But I'm not going to go home expecting to be a son. I'm going to go home hoping Dad will let me be a servant. At least I'll have enough to eat. At least I'll have clothes to wear, a place to stay, I'm going home. And I suspect, however far the far country was, it was further than he wanted to go. But he had no choice. So he walked home, we assume. And as he walked home, I can almost hear him practicing. Can't you, Father? I'm coming back, not not to be a son, but a servant. Father, I'm coming back, not to be a son, but to be a servant. Father, I'm coming back, not to be, he wants to get the pitch right, he wants to get the tone right, he wants everything to come out just right, because he's humbling himself before his father and saying, I was wrong, and I want you to take me back. But you don't have to put me in the house. You don't have to give me my own room. We all could learn a little bit from that prodigal son. God doesn't have to do anything for us. But if he didn't, where would we be? So he does. But at any rate, he finally gets close enough to home that his father is standing there watching. I wonder if he went up there every day and looked. Maybe today. Maybe he'll come home today. Now you might say, Sam, why didn't the father just go into the the lost uh, country or the far country of sin and and drag his boy back? Because God doesn't work that way. God allows us to be free moral agents. That simply means he gives us the right to choose whether we'll serve him or not. 
He gives us the right to choose the way we will live. But there's a very important clause that has to be included with that. You have to accept the consequences of your choice. He did it looking in a pan full of pig slop. Sometimes we do worse things than that. But he looks and all of a sudden the days arrive. The sons come home. And the father runs to him and hugs him and kisses him on the neck. He gives orders to plan a party, to celebrate, to put a new robe on him, to put a ring on his finger. In other words, to let him come home a son. You know, that's what God does with all of us when we're washed with him in baptism for the remission of our sins. He lets us come back to him as his children. But why was that boy lost? He was lost because he just made up his mind he was going to leave. There are people who do do that. My younger brother has done that. I have other loved ones who've done that. They just leave. It's not carelessness. They know what they're doing. They they plan to do it. It's not even the carelessness of others. No one's done anything to them that I know of that would drive them away. They just left because they chose to leave. And by the way, that may well be why God did not go into the far country and drag him back. You see, God allows us to leave. We have to choose whether we'll come back or not. I can't make that choice for you. You can't make that choice for me. Some simply rebel. They become lost through choice. If you've had more than one child, have you ever noticed how sometimes one of them can be harder to raise than the other? That makes sense, does it? I think of two brothers out at 100 that... uh, Grew up in the same home to the same parents, went to the same church, to the same school, had the same teaching, and one of them would be afraid lightning would strike if he went to church and the other one was a Bible class teacher. I don't know why that happens, except that some people just decide to leave. And when you decide to leave, no one, Not even God can decide you'll come back. You have to do that. Paul chose to be faithful. And he chose well. Israel chose to disbelieve. And they paid for it in the wilderness. They both had a choice. Each could have gone one way or the other. Paul chose to go with the father. The Israelites chose to leave the father behind. It's a frightening word, loss. Because it it signals the end of peace, the end of decency, the end of of being unafraid and, and optimistic for so many people. But all of that taken into account, you're still lost. It may have been your carelessness. If it was, you're close enough to home now to come back. It may have been through the carelessness of others. Pray for that person, whoever it was. They need your prayers. And pray for yourself that you won't let them or anyone else ever trip you up again. God hasn't done anything to hurt you. 
don't take it out on the church. And by all means, don't just turn and walk away. Whatever the problem, whatever the issue, whatever the circumstance, you still need God. And at just that point in time when you think that you'd be better off without God, you need him more than you've ever needed him before. Because you turned your back on him. And he's waited all of the time for you to come home. Now I want to close with one other thought. It's believed by many scholars that Jesus told all three of those parables to get to the older brother. And that the one Jesus was really, really concerned about was the older brother. Well, Sam, he didn't leave home. I know. Sam, he didn't tell his father, I wish you'd die. I know. But he hated. He hated what his father was doing for that younger son. He was the scribes and the Pharisees. He was the group that was laughing at Jesus and calling Jesus' judgment into question and ridiculing Jesus for spending so much time with elder brothers, with those scribes and Pharisees. You might say that both of that man's sons were lost. One was lost far away. The other was lost at home. But lost is still lost. We close tonight by telling you that we're about to stand and sing an invitation song. It's designed for those who are lost. For whatever reason, They're no longer in the right relationship with God. If you've been baptized at some earlier time, we can pray with you over whatever it is that has upset you or or hurt you or caused you to drift from God. We'll pray for you and we'll pray with you about it. Help you in any way we can. I've known the elders here for, it seems like a lifetime. I know they'll be here for you. I know you have friends and brothers and sisters in Christ in this building that would do anything within the realm of possibility for you. Now's the time to come home. If you've obeyed the gospel and drifted away, we'll pray for you. If you have yet to obey the gospel and put your Lord on in baptism, why not tonight? There's more rings, there's more fatted calves There's more new robes. All you have to do is come on. Kyle will be at the front to receive you and accept your confession uh, of belief in Christ as the Son of God. And we'll be singing from our hearts that you'll respond. If you need to come, don't be lost anymore. Come now.